So uh, just a couple of brief uh, housekeeping things. First, um, we're going to be spending three weeks uh, on this topic, the apostolic era. Um, interestingly enough, it is actually the kind of starts with the first generation after the apostles are all gone, and we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, but it's kind of the era from when the New Testament had all the books of the New Testament had been written through to the time when Christianity became uh, the official religion uh, of the Roman Empire around the Mediterranean. So kind of that formative time uh, when people were really trying to nail down, you know, what, what exactly do we believe and what does that mean uh, for how we live as a church, for how we live as disciples. Uh, so we'll be spending three weeks with that. Following that third week, uh, we will get into Lent and um, uh, I would encourage everybody to find a, uh, a Lent group to gather with. I hope in the next week or two to have some people uh, willing to host. Uh, for those who are available during the day, our Wednesday morning group is going to become uh, a Lent study group. We're going to be using the Alpha course, uh, which is originally put together by the Church of England, but it is uh, very ecumenical uh, and asks uh, each week asks kind of a big question about our faith and then kind of guides us through some discussion on that. Uh, Wednesday evenings at 7, uh, we are going to have evening prayer services. Zach is putting those together, uh, and you may or may not have heard that he is looking for lay preachers. So uh, if that is something you would be interested in, uh, uh, in trying, uh, we would love to have you participate in that. Uh, or I'll flip it the other way. Uh, if every week you see me up there and you go, you know, I, I think I could do that. Um, this would absolutely be a wonderful opportunity to, uh, to give it a try. So uh, we've got that going on. Um, I think those are the, the key things I wanted to uh, lift up for you. And like I said, I hope to have uh, a little more information on who will be leading some Lent groups and what times and where they're going to be leading them uh, so everybody can be a part of that. So let me start as we often start with a new topic. Uh, let me just kind of see where we are at. Um, what do we know about this particular era of church history, kind of after the close of the New Testament, uh, but before the church becomes the church? Um, what do we know about this early and formative time? Probably not much. Okay. And that is perfectly okay. We're here to learn about it. So, uh, you know, if we're, if we're starting and saying, yeah, I don't know a ton, that's perfectly okay. Um, once in a while, people say things to me like, gosh, I can't come to Bible study because I don't know enough about the Bible. And I keep trying to tell people, <laughs> that's exactly why we want you to come. We're, we're here to learn. So, um, uh, uh, do, do most people echo Tom's sentiment there? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see some. I see some yes. nodding. Okay. All right. Well, guess what? You're in luck. You will know a lot more after tonight uh, than you do at the moment, and you will know a heck of a lot more uh, by three weeks from now. So let us go ahead and dive in. Uh, so for everybody who has the the handout there, I started with some icons. Um, and these are kind of the three sources uh, on this early era that we're going to deal with tonight. Uh, the first was uh, St. Clement of Rome, uh, and he was writing about the same time as the book of Revelation was being written. Uh, he was a bishop in Rome, so usually when you see an icon of him, he's depicted with a staff and a stole. So he looks very, very pastoral there, uh, very bishop-like. Um, second source we're going to look at is St. Ignatius of Antioch, um, and he wrote a lot in his writings about the importance of martyrdom, uh, and he said, I am God's wheat, I am being ground by the teeth of wild beasts so that I may prove pure bread. Uh, so in icons, uh, as you can see on your handout, he is often depicted being eaten by lions. Um, now you know. Uh, the, the other source that we're going to spend a little time with tonight is called the Didache, which is a Greek word that means 12. Uh, it is called the teaching of the Lord to the Gentiles by the 12 apostles. Um, 
It was probably not actually written by the apostles, but like many other ancient documents, had someone else's name attached to it to give it greater authority. Um, but you can see an icon there of the of the 12 apostles. So I want you to uh, participate in a little thought exercise with me. All of a sudden, all of the pastors, all of the interns, all of your synod people, and your seminary professors vanish. Poof. We are gone. You have a few books of the Bible, and you know that there are some other churches out there. Uh, you know that they're out there, and you're assuming, well, if all of our people are gone, their people are probably gone too. Um, what next? What do, what do we do? Start a new, start some kind of church. So we, we start something new. Okay, what, what all does that entail? What do we have to do if we want to start something new? Well, I think we'd have to find a leader that is pretty versed in the Bible and um, believes what we believe. Hmm. So you kind of have to articulate what exactly you believe. You have to figure out you know, what does this whole following Jesus thing mean? And so are you putting... saying that this would be if there were never was any church as we know it? Are you asking that? Because then there might be different answers. No, I'm, I'm saying that uh, you, you're already part of a church. Okay. You're, you're already all at Holy Shepherd. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Wendy sends out an email and says, you know what? Eric disappeared. Zach is also <laughs> gone. I called the synod. They're gone. I called the seminary because I thought, you know, they may have some people over there and they're gone. So here we are as our community and we've got no one that we would normally turn to uh, for leadership is there. I think as a practical matter, this is somewhat timely right now because that is somewhat of the trend. We have an awful lot of churches that no longer have enough size to have a full-time pastor. And actually the pastor works, I hate to use this word, kind of as a ringmaster with, with a group of lay pastors. Basically he, is, he or she has become the leader and has the um, other lay pastors happening. And we know this is a, is a significant thing because in the last 20 years, the, the Indiana, Kentucky sin has lost about 30% of its churches. Wow. And the other ones they're keeping, they will have to be the two point parishes or have lay pastors and lay members taking up more of what would have traditionally been the pastoral role. So I do think there's some relevancy in that. Yeah. Um, yeah. When, when the people who are commonly recognized as, as authoritative are no longer available for whatever reason, uh, you got to construct some kind of structure um and you know that that does not necessarily i mean it could be a very um uh kind of very one level structure uh it could be a hierarchical structure but you you got to have something in place for your community um andrew and yeah, nick you know, <laughs> andrew and nick have have been thrust into yes into leadership here. And Tom um, as well. <laughs> there you go. And yeah, so, that's right. Tom's really good too. I think we'd want to rely very heavily on the good Lord to guide us then. <laughs> so We do anyway. So sure. how do you decide what your relationship is with other churches? You know they're out there. Um, you just kind of ignore them. You say, yeah, we're kind of keeping tabs on them. You get together and say, what can we do together? Uh, what, what's your relationship to other congregations? Because remember, the official structures that connect them are gone. You're you're there initially on your own. What, what do you what do you do next? Well, I suppose you'd find out if there's enough common ground that you were in, you could work together on certain objectives. Again, there you'd have okay. to determine if there's enough common ground between you on that. I mean, if, if uh, and, and also, even if there isn't common ground in every area, find out the common ground that you can agree upon in the major issues. 
I mean, if we were to look at uh, the churches in our area, a Lutheran church is going to be strongly believing in justification by faith alone, and a Baptist church might have a little bit more work righteousness in it. But there are certainly some areas that we could work together on as a common ground on that one. And definitely yeah. make sure we're not fighting, even if we disagree on those certain areas, that we're not fighting each other and hurting each other. Yeah, so, yeah, we, we again, we got to figure out what exactly it is we believe, because, yeah, maybe our thing, there are things we can do better working together. We just got to make sure these are people we can work together with in good faith. Um, you know, how do we, how do we decide what we're going to teach? That's all tied into articulating what we believe. Um, you know, we, we just decided, people just nominated, you know, Andrew, Nick and Tom have been thrust into leadership. How much authority do we give them? Like they have the authority to come in and preach on Sunday. Can they preside for communion? Can they say who, who can and can't be a member of the church? What, what kind of authority are we willing to uh, delegate to Tom, Nick and Andrew? Aren't we going to want to keep that as limited as possible? Uh, just because of the fact that anything that would be done would have to be in accordance with the scriptures. And then we'd also have to bifurcate everything between financial and religious. Right. So you're going so, to have, you know, yeah. that you're going to have to keep, oh, I think okay. that any church to succeed is going to have to have its basis. It's going to have to have its fundamental basis on the religion. And also it's going to have to have an openness to all other accounts and records. Yeah, and so you said, you know, we need to make sure everything is uh, scripturally sound. We need to make sure that we are you know, kind of working uh, in accord with God's word. Uh, and that's important. That's a little simpler for us. We have a long tradition of saying we got 66 books that are official. If it's in one of those books, yeah, that, that's a talking point. If it's not, probably not. Now imagine that we didn't actually agree on which books were actually part of the Bible. It gets more complicated <laughs> there. Mm -hmm. So um, this, this wasn't just a thought exercise for the early church. This, this was reality. Um, congregations had been started by uh, traveling apostles, Paul, of course, being the most prominent. But we know there were other people founding churches because Paul comes across a church in Rome that's already there when he gets there. Um, you know, Paul gets up into uh, parts of Anatolia and he comes across people and they say, well, what is this Holy Spirit? We, we've only been baptized the way John the Baptist baptized people. So, um, you know, there's varying levels of, of knowledge in different places. Um, the apostles, of course, were the, the early authorities. They are the people who actually were with Jesus during his ministry. Jesus said, you are the people who are going to continue what I've begun. So it was fairly simple for, you know, somebody to say, uh, yeah, you know, the, the 12, I'm, I'm one of the 12, I was with Jesus, and this is what I have to say. That, that's pretty clear cut, but the apostles died off, and that commonly recognized source of authoritative people was gone, yet those questions of, you know, what exactly do we believe? Uh, how do we organize our community? Um, how do we worship even? Um, those questions that we, we hear addressed in the New Testament had not been decisively answered. Um, but you didn't have that pool of leaders where you could turn to and say, well, this person spent time with Jesus. They probably have a pretty good idea. No, those people are all gone. So what we end up with in this apostolic era are uh, the people who are working on answering these questions uh, and doing the best they can without having that direct link uh, to Jesus. Uh, they are often referred to as the apostolic fathers. Um, all of the writings that we have uh, were by men. Um, I have no doubt that there were apostolic mothers. We just don't have uh, anything that they have written. So some of the uh, things that are going on in this time, the church, of course, grew really rapidly in this time. So it, it added uh, a layer of necessity to answering these questions. 
Uh, and there were several circumstances that helped the, uh, the church spread so quickly in this time. Um, part of what was going on was what was called the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. Uh, after a couple generations of almost constant warfare around the Mediterranean, um, finally, uh, Octavian, who later renamed himself Augustus, uh, defeated everyone else. There was no one left to fight. Uh, and so they had the Roman peace. Um, this was really good for some people. It was not nearly as good for others, which is why you still had uh, rebellions and uprisings from place to place. But on the whole, the Mediterranean world was pretty calm and quiet, or about as calm and quiet as it was going to be. So as a result of that, you had probably the best transportation in the ancient world. Uh, the Romans were great road builders uh, and one of Julius Caesar's claims to fame was the way he hunted down pirates. He had actually been uh, abducted by pirates and after someone paid the, uh, the ransom to get him free, he came back uh, and crucified all the pirates. Um, so anyway, both travel on land was relatively easy and travel by sea was relatively safe. Um, so if you wanted to spread a message, uh, you know, a message about a religion per se, uh, getting far away was, you know, by ancient standards, actually pretty easy in this time period. Um, of course, one of the things you, you discover if you travel, uh, travel outside the United States, um, people speak different languages and depending on where you go, it can be hard to understand or make yourself understood. Um, in the Roman Empire at this time, um, there were kind of two common languages. A whole heck of a lot of people, a, a large majority of people kind of from Italy West uh, spoke at least some Latin. So if you spoke Latin, there were giant areas of the country or giant areas of the empire you could go and you could talk to most of the people. Uh, kind of from the Balkans East, the common language was Greek. So if you spoke Greek, you could talk to most of the people. Uh, and we see the, the records uh, kind of seem to indicate that being bilingual was a lot more common uh, in antiquity than it is in the modern United States. Even in other parts of the world today, um, a lot of places, uh, more people are bilingual than they are here. So if you could speak Latin or Greek, you were pretty well set. If you could speak them both, that you were, you were set. So again, if you wanted to spread an idea, you wanted to spread um, you know, a, a way of life, it was also really easy to do because you could write it in one of these two languages and you knew that pretty much anywhere you went, someone was going to be able to understand it and translate for you. Uh, along with that, uh, there was relatively high literacy, uh, about 15% uh, of the population they think was literate, you know, able to read and write. So that means in the size group that we have tonight, one of us, someone here would be able to read and write. So we would get this letter and, you know, if I wasn't able to read it, I would bring it to our, our gathering and I would know at least one person here is going to be able to read it. So that literacy again helps with the spread of ideas. Um, in a sense, the Roman, Roman kind of take on things encouraged a kind of a high degree of freedom of religion. Um, now, certainly there were some interesting caveats to that, but on the whole, the Romans more or less practiced, you know, you want to worship this, that, or the other, that's great. You go ahead. In Rome, they built the pantheon, the temple to all gods. And often anytime they uh, conquered uh, a, a territory, they would tell the people there, hey, why don't you send us a statue of your gods because, you know, you're part of us now and we'll put it up in the pantheon. You know, you pray to your gods for us. We'll pay to pray to our gods for us. Everybody wins. As long as uh, the new religion allowed for the veneration of the emperor as a god, they were more often than not pretty okay with it. There were a few exceptions, but generally um, 
new religions came in often and they were often just kind of looked at and said, yeah, this is fine. You, you guys come on in and, you know, we'll, we'll put up a statue of your God too. Um, and part of what was going on with that was that made, made it a very cosmopolitan religious scene. Um, sometimes we may think that people came to Christianity from having no faith, but more likely they had some other kind of faith. Um, all the traditional Greek and Roman gods, but, um, you know, gods from Iran, gods from uh, Scandinavia and Germany, gods from Africa, um, all, whatever you wanted to worship, you could find it there. Um, in this time, a lot of these faiths did have resurrection stories as a part of their understanding, uh, and many of them had common meals. Um, there was a religion uh, that worshipped a deity called Mithras, and this was very popular with Roman soldiers, and one of the things they would do was they would gather for a meal, and they would share a common cup, and they would share a loaf of bread. Um, so some of the things that Christians were doing, um, which today we look at and we go, yeah, they, they share a common cup, they share bread together, we go, that's unmistakably Christian. Uh, for many people, they would say, yeah, you know, it's just it's kind of a thing that religious people do, right? Uh, regardless of, of which one. So there were a lot of things that um, kind of set the stage for Christianity to, uh, to spread quickly and spread far. Um, all those historical factors aside, we also cannot forget the lifestyle of the Christians and the way they treated one another and the way they treated other people um, were, were critically important. Uh, the Holy Spirit absolutely worked through the quality of the Christian community. Um, some historians have also surmised that um, Christian communities had a higher survival rate during plagues because the Christians took better care of each other than did other groups. Um, so there are all of these uh, you know, kind of historical factors in place, but the actual actions and lives that the Holy Spirit empowered these Christians to live, uh, that, that had a lot to do with it too. So we certainly do not want to leave the Holy Spirit out. Uh, questions, comments, concerns, insights, thoughts? So, Question, One of Pastor. Other things, let's go. Yes. Was the organized religion, though, another way for people to become more literate, though, when they would come into those groups? Hmm. I, I don't know for a fact. My gut tells me probably not. Um, because the, the educational system was not really uh, tied to any particular religious group. Um, you know, you had your philosophical schools and so on. Um, that was tied usually more to class uh, than religious group. Now, of course, later, you know, in Christianity, they started building monasteries, and people would go there, and a lot of the brothers and sisters would learn how to read. The church started building universities and you would go there and you would learn to read. Um, but in this time, to the best of my knowledge, um, becoming a part of one religion or another um, wasn't really, uh, didn't really open a path to education. Uh, it may have opened or certainly closed other doors, uh, but I don't think that was one of them. So the other thing to navigate at this time is that by the time of the apostolic age, the split between church and synagogue was becoming pretty clear and pretty solidly in place. We see the roots of this in the New Testament itself. So we see this you know, in, in the time of Jesus. Um, the temple establishment, um, really is kind of the source of resistance to Jesus. Um, 
And we see that in the Gospels. It's the temple establishment. It's the high priest who says, you know, better for one person to die than, you know, a calamity to happen to the whole nation. Um, you know, meaning Jesus specifically, not just any one person. Um, and the Gospel of Matthew, uh, for those who studied the Gospel of Matthew with me, uh, if we remember that um, in Matthew, Jesus is really emphatic, you know, you're going to be thrown out of their synagogues. In their synagogues, those people who are not like us don't understand what's, what God is up to. Um, and by the end of Matthew's gospel, Jesus, you can read it many different ways. I think you can very uh, faithfully read it. He, he kind of comes unglued there for a little bit and, and just tears into the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, and so uh, there, there is that dynamic going on in the Gospel of John. Um, and, and we'll definitely get into this in more detail when we study the Gospel of John. Um, the Judeans uh, are maligned pretty often and, and pretty severely. Um, so you can see, see kind of that, that tension within uh, Jewish people who believed that Jesus was the Messiah and Jewish people who didn't. Um, Paul, of course, uh, was really adamant, you know, people who say we need to become Jewish in the traditional sense first and then become Christian. No, that is not at all the case. God is up to something new. Now, of course, as we learned studying Romans, Paul also says there is a lot of value in Christianity's Jewish heritage. But he says that value is not necessarily tied to whether you are justified by what God has done in Jesus. So even within the New Testament, we're starting to see the roots of that, that split between temple and synagogue. And what really kind of accelerated that split was the Jewish war uh, that took place between the years 66 and 70. Um, so prior to that, you had a number of different Jewish groups. The ones that we have the best historical record on were the Pharisee or the Sadducees. Um, we hear about them in the New Testament. They're more or less tied to the temple. Uh, in the year 70, the temple was burned to the ground. So no temple, no Sadducees. We had the Essenes. They're the Dead Sea Scrolls people. Um, most of them either died fighting uh, or committed suicide. So they are, they are not really in the picture. Then you had the Pharisees, and the Pharisees were always interested in, we know exactly what to do when we go to Jerusalem to the temple for pilgrimages and festivals. How do we live faithfully the other 350 some days out of the year? How do we live faithfully, you know, in our, in our town in Galilee and apply God's word? How do we apply the Torah to life each and every day? So suddenly when the temple was gone, all of that discussion the Pharisees had had about how do we do this faithfully every day apart from the temple, uh, that remained really relevant. You also had initially the Jewish group of people who said, uh, pardon me, you also had the people who said, um, hey, guess what? Uh, um, Jesus is the Messiah. All of these promises out of the Old Testament, he, he has fulfilled them. So, um, you had the Christians and the Pharisees. Both of them are kind of vying for the title of, yes, we are the faithful heirs to the story of Israel, the story that God began uh, with uh, Abraham. You know, that continues through our people, not through them. Um, we see this in the New Testament. We also see it in some of the early rabbinic literature. So some of the uh, Pharisees tried to bring in some reforms and they said, we need to be a little more strict about who can call themselves Jewish and who can't. Um, so they were saying, we need to draw that line and make it a little clearer for people. Um, the Pharisees de developed a synagogue service that included the 18 benedictions, uh, which if I remember right, there's actually 19 of them, but they call it the 18 for reasons I don't know. The twelfth of these benedictions, may the Nazarenes and the heretics perish as in a moment, and may they be blotted out of the book of life and not enrolled with the righteous. Um, that idea, the Nazarenes, is that 
ringing any bells with anybody or remind you of anyone in particular? Maybe sounds like a place in the New Testament. Jesus and the Christians? Yep, we're, we're guessing that's probably referring to the Christians. Um, you know, the people who follow the guy from Nazareth, the Nazarenes. Um, yeah, may, may they be cursed. Um, so again, kind of interesting that it's called a benediction. Anyway, um, and then as we've seen in the New Testament, the, the feeling is mutual. So the Christians are suddenly find themselves outside of the synagogue. So they said, you know, we've had this way of organizing ourselves as community, and suddenly we've been thrown out of that community. Maybe we don't want to look to the same place for kind of our model of leadership. They started looking increasingly to Greek and Roman models uh, of leadership as they said, you know, we got we to gotta structure our communities somehow. Um, and so we eventually see that, um, you know, like a diocese we think of as it's an area where a bunch of churches are kind of linked together somehow. Diocese was originally like a state in the Roman Empire. Um, so the church definitely imported a lot of stuff directly from Greek and Roman uh, setups like that. So it became less like the synagogue and more like uh, any kind of Roman organization. Let me stop there. Uh, questions, thoughts, insights? All right. So that's kind of the, the, the wide background of what is going on here. Uh, some of the earliest sources we have uh, were letters written by Clement, uh, who was an early bishop in Rome, by Ignatius, uh, who was a Christian author who uh, came from Antioch, uh, which I believe it was the Antioch in Syria. Uh, there were many places named Antioch, um, who was uh, arrested and sent to Rome to be executed. Um, so on his way to be killed as a martyr, he wrote extensively about how important it is to be a martyr. Uh, and this document called the Didache. We're gonna spend a little bit of time with each of those tonight and touch on uh, uh, some of the issues that each of those raised. Um, so Clement wrote several letters. Uh, one of them, first Clement, uh, was written uh, about the same time as the book of Revelation. So we're looking sometime in that last decade of the first century. And actually in a lot of early lists of books of the New Testament, this letter shows up as a canonical book of scripture. So there was debate in the early church as to, you know, does Clement, is he as authoritative as one of the gospels, as one of Paul's letters? Uh, and many people seem to think that he was. Um, some of the important things that Clement brought to the conversation was he said we need to have a kind of a larger church structure. We cannot just have congregations kind of operating in isolation from one another. Um, and he claimed that this actually was, was divinely inspired. Um, but he said, you know, there should be uh, bishops uh, which comes from the word episkopos. Uh, it's the Greek word for an overseer. So you've got uh, a guy to actually handle running your farm. So he watches and makes sure the workers are doing what they need to be. That guy was called episkopos, the overseer. He says, we need a similar sort of thing. We need somebody to kind of take charge of an area and, and keep everybody honest. Beneath them, you would have elders or presbyters, um, and they would be the people who would kind of handle things within individual gatherings of, of Christians. The authority that these people had was to impose penance. So if they said, hey, you know what? Kim has done something that does not reflect, you know, living a faithful life. She is going to have to do X, Y, and Z to kind of retrain herself to live faithfully. It wasn't, it was not um, necessarily a, a situation where they said, oh, okay, 
uh, Tom has committed this many sins, so he needs to do this many good things to balance it out. Because remember, God is not God is not a divine score pe- scorekeeper. God is the one who just looks at the the scorecard and wipes it clean. But one of the other key things in uh, Clement's writings is this emphasis on harmony in the congregation. We need to keep our communities healthy. We need to keep our communities functional. Um, and there's you know several reasons for this. Um, obviously, you want your church community to be a place where you can go and it's not just constantly filled with strife and fighting. Um, but you may be being persecuted. Um, externally. You want your church to be a place where you can come and be safe and be strong together to withstand that persecution. And uh, Clement lifts up this idea of uh, repentance and penance. You know, how do we turn and walk in a more faithful direction? What actions can we take to retrain ourselves to live faithfully? Um, He wants people to take advantage of those things regularly um, for keeping the community Uh, keeping the community a harmonious place. Uh, He says, hey, look at the book of Jonah. The whole point of the book of Jonah is that God wants people to repent. You know, John the Baptist, Jesus, they both clearly say, this is a part of how we work in our community. And that leads me to the other important thing uh, that was really front and center for Clement. Um, He was really big on the authority of scripture. Um, You know, he cites Old Testament stories, he cites New Testament stories, Um, he says, my position on this issue, you know, my position that repentance matters, comes right from scripture. Now, the really critical thing about Clement is he is the first person we know of who, when he cites scripture, is not only referring to what we call the Old Testament. Clement refers to the book of Matthew. He refers to it as scripture, and he says this carries the same authority as Genesis or Isaiah or Jeremiah or Psalms. So he's the first person we know of who actually cites a New Testament book as authoritative scripture. Uh, He actually cites uh, Matthew 9, 13. Um, Would someone care to share Matthew 9, 13 with us? I can do it. There weren't Bible verses in here, so I didn't have mine. I got it here. Oh, Oh, very good. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. So, um, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense when he's talking about, you know, what really, what really matters for how we live in a community is mercy. Uh, If his emphasis is on, I want to make sure that this community is living in a way that will not bring unwanted negative attention to our community. Yeah, it kind of makes sense that he's saying, you know, God is wanting us to, you know, exercise mercy as one of our our most important virtues. So uh, it all kind of comes together. So uh, Clement is, is uh, again, important for emphasizing a church structure, for emphasizing the importance of peaceful living within the congregation, uh, and for the authority of scripture, including uh, New Testament books that carry the weight, uh, car- carry the authority uh, of the Old Testament as well. Thoughts, questions, comments on uh on Clement? Um, going, on Clement, uh, going back on my uh, mediocre but not totally insignificant knowledge of Roman Catholicism, um, is I believe that you know the, the whole Catholic idea or trump card is that they have they have a 
chain going all the way back to St. Peter. And if I'm not mistaken, Clement is listed as the second Pope, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I think he might have been third or fourth. Hmm. But yeah, he was, okay. well, he was certainly was on mediocre. the list. Okay. Right. But that that's a fascinating, or let, let, let me stop there. Uh, was there more... Uh, was there more to what you were going to say? Well, you referred to him as a you referred to him as a bishop yourself, which meant you know back in the in the in the uh, Roman Catholic way of looking at things, he had he had the laying of hands that that's connected back to um, Peter. I right. mean, is there any? I know there's no proof of any of this, any of this, and 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 as you go through the. Uh, time, I think, for much of the first two or three centuries, there's no real record of or organization that, you know, the, the succession of popes that they list had any, any um, you know, real historical proof, for lack of a better term. Right. So, um yeah, he, he's referred to in, in sources we have as a bishop. He's referred to as a bishop in Rome. However, the word, uh, the, the idea of the Pope, he is not just happens to be the kind of lead church guy in a particular area, but he is like the bishop of bishops. That did not develop until much later. Um, so to say... I think regardless of your ecclesiology, regardless of your um, kind of historical take on it, people would agree, yes, Clement was, was a bishop of Rome, but Pope carries with it, uh, you know, in, in Latin, they are the Pontifex Maximus, which was originally a title used by the emperor. So somewhere along the line, the bishops in Rome said, you know what, emperor? We're going to take that job from you, the, the highest priest. Um, that didn't really develop until much, much later, maybe the fifth century, where people would say, hey, you know what, maybe the guy in Rome is who we need to turn to as, as authoritative. Um, so he was a bishop. He probably oversaw a number of congregations within Rome, but he was just one of many bishops. I mean, there were bishops all across the Mediterranean world. Um, you know, Jerusalem obviously had a strong claim to saying, yeah, you know what, the people here are the real deal. Um, later, Constantinople they said, yeah, you know, the people who are here are the real deal. Alexandria was a very prominent uh, center of Christian thought. So there were bishops all over the place uh, who all had, you know, fairly significant authority, but there at that time was not a single bishop or a single uh, area that was really recognized by everyone else as being authoritative. So um, I, I would absolutely say, yeah, he's definitely on the list of people who were Bishop of Rome. Um, depending on if, if you are coming at it from a Catholic perspective, the fact that he's the Bishop of Rome makes him by default a Pope. Um, but I think the Pope, as we understand it, there, there was no papacy yet. Uh, if that makes sense, does that does that make sense? Yeah, yes, but okay. but um, I agree with what you say totally. But uh, they do list popes going all the way back to Peter, as yep. you know, and how they did that, I have no idea. Uh, but I just know that that exists. Yes. And the phenomenon you're referring to is known as apostolic succession. That was a uh, point of discussion when the ELCA entered full communion with the, I'll say it was the Episcopal Church. And I don't remember the exact nature of it, but it was, you know, do we all agree on apostolic succession, which technically I think Lutherans can get on board with because Luther himself was ordained in the Catholic Church. So you know, the succession would have gone down through them, and then Luther ordained other people, and all of the other prominent early Lutherans were ordained in the Catholic Church. So, uh, in theory, if that is important to you, um, 
you know, we, we still are descended from that. You know, when I was ordained as a pastor, the bishop and a bunch of other pastors came and laid hands on me. And when they were ordained, the bishop and a bunch of other pastors came and laid hands on them. So if that is something that, that is significant to you, uh, yeah, you know, you, you can trace that. You can still trace that back in the Lutheran church. Um, I think the Luther role of the Holy Spirit. Martin Luther had been excommunicated. Would that break a chain in his ability to have apostolic connect, uh, succession with the Catholic church? I, I would say from the Catholic church point of view, yes. Oh. I, I have no clue. Uh, it's I know not that a question they recanted that I've, I've that ever spent a ton of time with. I'm sorry, uh, say that again, please. I, I believe they might have, in recent era, have recanted that some of that excommunication of Martin Luther. But uh, anyway, that is probably more beer drinking topics than anything else. That's right. I mean, my, my glass is empty. I could go refill it with something adult, but, but I won't, you know. There's carbs in that, so, um, so there. Um, and they certainly did not have the cool Pope hat at that time, so, um, so what's the point? Um, our next person we're going to spend a little time with is uh, uh, is Saint Ignatius. Uh, he was also a bishop, uh, like uh, Clement was, but he was a bishop in Antioch. Uh, and he was arrested and sentenced to be executed in Rome. Uh, this happened during the reign of the Emperor Trajan. Um, so very early part of the second century uh, when the Roman Empire was at its greatest extent. Uh, um, and it's interesting that he was arrested uh, and sent to be executed under the reign of Trajan. Trajan, we have a letter that he wrote to a uh, Roman governor in the Eastern Mediterranean. And the governor said, we've got all these crazy people who get up early Sunday morning and worship this God called Jesus. Um, you know, we've just been arresting a bunch of them. Everybody's been reporting them, uh, but I don't know what you want me to do because we're arresting so many people. I don't know what to do with them. Uh, and Trajan more Trajan said, um, you know, you can't arrest anybody based on an anonymous accusation. Uh, and unless there's something really seedy going on, you know, just kind of, just kind of let these people lie. Um, anyhow, uh, Ignatius uh, is kind of interesting. He seems, uh, his writings, uh, he cites Matthew. So once again, Clement cited Matthew, Ignatius cited Matthew. Uh, he also cites 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, and first and second Timothy. So it's really interesting to see that, um, you know, by the very earliest part of the second century, uh, one of the gospels was in kind of wide circulation. People all over the place knew Matthew and were starting to say, yeah, this, this is authoritative. We can look to Matthew for guidance. But also um, these letters of Paul I mean, the Gospels were written expressly, you know, to share the message of Jesus. Paul's letters were written to answer questions in a particular place. And yet by this period in history, people are saying, yeah, you know, we can look to Paul for faithful answers. So uh, letters that he wrote to Corinth and Ephesus, people are saying, yes, these are authoritative. Letters he wrote to Timothy. People are saying, yes, this advice is not just for him. It is for the whole church. So it's kind of interesting that we can see the uh, progression of understanding there. Ignatius uh, was really uh, particularly interested uh, in the importance of the incarnation. Uh, he was also interested in church structure. He um, so... Clement had kind of a two-tiered system. He said, you're going to have bishops and you're going to have elders. Ignatius said, we're going to have a three-tiered system. So his was getting a little more pyramid shaped. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting development there. Uh, and he was very interested in martyrdom. He said that that was really important for a faithful person. And that would have a lot of influence on the church in the centuries to come this importance of martyrdom. So the incarnation, literally carne 
meat, flesh in Latin, God is here in the flesh. Why does that matter? Why is that a point of, of debate? Well, you had people largely influenced by Greek philosophy who said, you know, what really matters is the spiritual. This physical world, quite frankly, is gar garbage. It's terrible, uh, immoral, unethical. What really matters is the spiritual, the, the ethereal. And because Jesus is such a great guy, he obviously was not physical. He, he must have been a spirit that seemed to be a person. Uh, even more so, when he was resurrected, we were seeing the pure spiritual Jesus. So we weren't seeing an actual body that had been beaten bloody and then nailed to some rough-hewn wood and then stabbed. We weren't seeing that. We were seeing the spiritual Jesus. Based on what we know about scripture, um, what, what's wrong with this? There's no way he could have died for your sins if you never was anything more than a spirit. Yeah, uh, spirits don't die, uh, if, if we're looking at it in that way, for sure. Um, let's go back, back to Genesis, Genesis chapter 1. At the end of each day, God looks what God has made, and God says, It is good. It is this good. Is good. The end of day six, God has put everything in place. God looks at all of this physical creation God has made. There is not a word in there about there's some spiritual stuff that's kind of out there floating around. It's actual like rocks and water and light and animals. God looks at all of that together and God says, It is good. This is very good. In Hebrew, tov me'od, this is very good. So we have that. God, as we have learned from, uh, you know, studying the portions of, of the books of Moses that we have studied so far, God has a lot to say with how we live faithfully and, you know, how we use our bodies, what goes into our bodies, and so on. Um, so scripture is actually pretty specific about, you know, all this created stuff matters to God. Um, after the resurrection, Jesus appears to his disciples uh, in Luke's gospel. He goes into uh, the locked room, and what does he ask them? You guys got something to eat? Uh, he says, you know that a ghost, some of them said, we think we're seeing a ghost. And he says, a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones like you can clearly see that I have. Gospel of John. They're cooking fish on the beach. Jesus says, give me a piece of that. I need something to eat. Spirits and ghosts don't eat. So scripture is really, you know, really clear on this point. And yet, all of these people, I, again, I think largely under the influence of Greek philosophy, say, it just seemed like Jesus was a person. He was actually a spirit. Because spirit is good physical is bad. Ignatius really attacks that, that uh, idea. That uh, doctrine is called docetism, D-O-C-E-T-I-S-M, for those of you playing the home game, uh, from the Greek word dokeo, which means to seem. You know, it only seemed like he was a real person. Ignatius really um, goes after this. It sounds like he's citing an early creed. He writes uh, in one of his letters, Jesus was truly born. He really ate and really drank. He was really persecuted. He was truly crucified, truly died. He was also truly raised. Um, I mean, he's really emphatic. This stuff didn't just seem like it happened. This happened to a flesh and blood person because all this physical stuff God made and loved matters to God. Isn't there kind of a rise on spiritualism again? 
is you, see, you seem to hear many people quote that they are spiritual, they're spiritualists. My, my take on that is that it's a lot less technical. I think, and, and I'll just, full disclosure here, this, this is Eric's, Eric's take on the situation. I think a lot of that really has to do with when you say spiritual, it kind of opens you up to whatever feels good. If you say I am part of a religion, I am part of something that actually has specific teachings, which usually include things you should do and things you should not do. You know, it's true in Judaism, it's true in Christianity, it's true in Islam, it's true in Hinduism. Um, I think a lot of the times when people are saying they are spiritual, it's uh, almost a quintessentially American type of thing where we go, we kind of want to just do what we want. We don't want folks to you know, really tell us what's good or bad. I think the way a lot of people use it now is not as, um, not as theologically informed as, as what Ignatius was dealing with. Or structured. Um, Right, right. So that, that's, that's, that, that's my take on it. But the thing that I think is really cool about Ignatius is he goes on to explain that um, the people who say, well, you know, Jesus was just spiritual, you know, all the physical stuff doesn't matter. Ignatius says about these people, they have no concern for love, none for the widow none for the orphan, none for the oppressed, none for the prisoner, none for the hungry, none for the thirsty. Those people abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they refuse to acknowledge that the Eucharist is the flesh and blood of Jesus. So again, Ignatius is saying, uh, there's a saying you hear sometimes, you know, people are, are so heaven focused that they are of no earthly value. That's kind of what he's hitting on here. These people are so that they are so against anything that is uh, physical that they are ignoring the physical need of their neighbor right there in front of them. Um, you know, James talks about this in in the letter of James. You know, if your brother is hungry and you come in and say, "Bless you, we will feed you spiritually," and you send him on his way and he's still hungry, you haven't really done anything. Um, so again, this idea of, uh, the incarnation, it's not only a theological point, it has a lot to do with ethics. If you think the world is useless and bad, you're going to have a very different outlook on how you interact with other people and with creation than if you understand God made all of this and God said, all of this is good. In fact, it's so good. I'm willing to send Jesus to die in order to redeem it. So again, the incarnation, it's one of those words where sometimes we think it's, you know, what's, what's the, the question I would always ask in math class? What's an actual practical application of this? The incarnation, it's that, that neighbor over there who's hungry, their physical need actually needs to be met because their body matters to God. Um, So there, um, I, I could go on for a while about times I busted that question out in math class. Um, sometimes I did not get very good answers. Anyway, um, so Ignatius, real big on incarnation. I'll, I'll, I'll stop now. He advocated for a three-tiered church structure where you would have a bishop at the top of the pyramid. You would have presbyters or elders. Presbyter is simply the... Greek word for You're frozen. Froze up there, Pastor. Ignatius, uh, interestingly enough, was a bishop, and he believed that having a bishop was necessary for the church. And he said, if people have broken away from a church and they no longer have a bishop, they're actually not really a church. He said, only the Eucharist under the authority of a bishop is valid. As long as, as the Lord did nothing without the Father, you must not do anything without the bishop. And my favorite, we must regard the bishop 
as the Lord himself. So he was very much of the opinion that you needed to have a, a clear and that you needed to have a bishop, somebody who is recognized as an authority at the top of it. Okay, the this libertarian is, in me doesn't like that, but what is his scriptural basis for saying that we now have, we have to have a bishop that is basically God himself? Uh, that I am not sure of. Do not have any notes here on what his scriptural basis of that is. I do know that when I was looking over these notes, it reminded me of something that Pope Benedict said a number of years ago now, when he said, other Christians out there who are not under my authority as the Bishop of Rome, they gather into communities and that's all well and good, but they're not really a church the same way that we're the church because we have the bishop. So this, again, some of these things are, are cyclical, kind of interesting in that, but I do not know exactly where he draws his, um, where he draws his authority for that. If can I am- even, Can you even think of a place where he could draw such authority? Well, well going, going back in from a pure Catholic, uh, Catholicism point of view, they go back to, um, you are Peter, and, and upon this rock I will build my church. You know that, that that's certainly one one stroke of, of the of by of the Bible where they get some of that, and then and then also, uh, I'm, since I'm not a biblical expert, Pastor, you can help me out here. But I think it's it may be near the same place where they where Jesus tells the apostles the the that which you declare loose on on earth is is loosed in what you can say what you say is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven mm -hmm. um so the that's, another, that's another one yes the theologian's well, term for that is the office of the keys which is why the papal insignia has keys on it so in other uh, words it's it sounds like there's really no basis for that other than it's pretty darn convenient because yeah, I don't I, see I where I, I don't see where I created a dot by 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 appointing Peter as my rock. I have now created a, a dynasty like the Davidic dynasty here. It's just kind of convenient. But the, there's also that point of the loosed on earth, loosed in heaven. It, it goes a little step further than just saying, "On this rock, I will build my church." So in First Timothy chapter three, there is a section on. Uh, on who is qualified to be a bishop and he talks a little bit about the character traits and kind of the lifestyle that somebody who wants to be a bishop should have so at least towards the la latter part of the new testament some people do recognize the office of bishop but to my knowledge there is not so so bishop is absolutely a part of the new testament there is somebody in that role overseeing congregations I do not know off the top of my head anywhere that kind of points to this level of authority. Anything that relates to you need to have a bishop in order to celebrate Holy Communion. That, that I do not believe is, is scriptural. Uh, where he got that from, I'm not sure. But again, it, it doesn't surprise me that a bishop is writing and saying, hey, you know, guys, bishops are really important. <laughs> Hey, real quick question, Pastor, because um, you froze up when you were talking about the three tiers, and I heard bishop and elders, and what was the third one? Bishops, elders, and deacons were the third oh, okay. one. And deacons, uh, we believe, were very similar to the deacon role described in the New Testament. It's actually the Greek word for a server. You would go somewhere for a meal, and a deacon would bring you the meal. It's that idea that they are the people who do the hands-on ministry. In fact, the seven deacons appointed to the book of Acts, they were there specifically to distribute food to people in need, if I am remembering that correctly. If I'm not, I'm sure somebody will remind me. So deacons also, again, so bishop, presbyter, deacon, these are all mentioned in the New Testament, 
and uh, people like Clement, people like Ignatius especially are kind of fleshing out what these roles mean and seemingly putting their own spin on it. But remember, suddenly there aren't apostles around anymore to ask about this. So they are, I believe, trying in good faith to answer this question of how do we set ourselves up as a community? Any other questions on, uh, on our, our guy Ignatius here? I find we martyrdom to... kind of interesting too, because he's on his way to being executed. So martyrdom all of a sudden becomes quite important to him also. Yes, yes, amazing how that happens. I think certainly in the New Testament, you can see obviously Jesus himself dies as a witness to faithfulness in God. Jesus would be first and foremost. But obviously you have Stephen, you have James, you have many people in the New Testament who die because they are witnesses to faithfulness in God. So again, it's a theme that we see in the New Testament, really scriptural, but it's being developed in a new way to speak to current issues because Ignatius is far from the only person who is being executed at this time. But yes, it is, again, it, it, it is quite convenient that as he is on, on his way to die as a martyr, he is writing, dying as a martyr is really important for your faith. So, so there. The last source we're going to touch on this evening before we wrap up is the didache, uh, which is from the Greek word for 12, uh, and it is the teaching of the 12 apostles. It is an early church manual. It is a document someone put together and said, if you want to have a community of Christians living and worshiping together, this is the kind of stuff you need to know. The first, it's kind of broken into three sections. The first is about the two ways. There's the way that leads to life, the way that leads to death. Uh, they very much pick up on Psalm 1 here, which I believe is our Psalm for this Sunday. The second section of it, so that talks a lot about uh, ethical living. How do you actually live as a disciple? The second section is guidance and instruction on what do we as Christians eat? How do we do baptism and what does it mean? What's the significance of fasting? How do we pray? When we celebrate the Eucharist, what do we do? How do we discern who our, who our leaders will be? And the final section is an apocalyptic section. Uh, it has a lot in common with Mark 13. We think he may have had a copy of Mark 13. He or she, whoever wrote this, had a copy of Mark 13 when, uh, when they wrote this, uh, which just goes to show that continuing importance of the apocalyptic literature in the church at that time. The key contributions uh, from the Didache they are very specific about the type of behavior that is expected of the faithful. There is a lot of outline, there's a significant outline of what worship should look like. They include instructions on fasting. There are texts of the Lord's Prayer. There are texts of prayers you can use as you are celebrating Holy Communion. In fact, the offertory prayer that we're using right now uh, as grains of wheat scattered on the hill were gathered together to become one bread. That is a prayer that is found in the Didache. So the prayer we are using today was written in this prayer book written around the year 100. Uh, and finally, there is again here a structure, a um, section on church structure. They talk about bishops and deacons a little bit but it is a lot more interested in how do you determine if a traveling apostle or a traveling prophet is genuine or if this person's a charlatan. So it seems to indicate a kind of structure where the community stayed in one place and they relied on transient leadership, people coming through town. And if you were relying on that, you needed a way to figure out who was legit and who wasn't. And so uh, it's broken into 15, 15 or so chapters. And 
chapter one seems to be very influenced by the Sermon on the Mount uh, and Psalm one. What does loving your neighbor mean? So this talks about what does it mean? We say love your neighbor. What, what do we think about that? Chapters two, three, four, and five, uh, they have a lot of lists. These are the behaviors you need to avoid. They start with the Ten Commandments. So again, we are grounded in scripture. Also says to avoid you know, many other things that would bring shame on the community. And also we are told not to consult astrologers or augurs. Uh, augurs among their jobs were to slaughter birds and examine the entrails to predict the future. So if you are thinking of doing that, the Didache says, this is not faithful. Chapter six kind of sums that up and it is a, it is urging us to make the right choice between the two ways, the way that leads to life and the way that leads to death. And it also closes with a final warning to stay away from meat sacrifice to idols. This person might have also had access to 1 Corinthians. That's very similar there. The church manual section is in the middle. Chapter 7, instructions about baptism. Chapter 8, instructions about fasting. Chapter, uh, second part of chapter 8, this is the Lord's Prayer. You need to pray it at these times. Chapters 9 and 10, this is how you celebrate Holy Communion. Chapter, uh, you have some other chapters in there. Uh, chapter 14 talks about, this is how you observe the Lord's Day. The first day of the week is holy to the Lord. These are the sorts of things you do to celebrate it. And then there is, like I said, there is a lot of content about how do you discern who, it, you know, which traveling prophets and apostles are, are faithful and what kind of authority do they have within the community? They also have a couple of verses only on appointing bishops and deacons. So it seems to be, like I said, this community relied on transient leadership. So they needed a structure in place, not necessarily that said, this is how we elect a bishop who stays in office for however long, but it was more along the lines of someone like Paul traveling apostle, a traveling prophet comes into town, how do we know that we should welcome this person and let that person exercise authority in our community? Let me stop there. Questions, comments, concerns, insights? It's pretty amazing that there was something written as you said, just 100 years after the time of Christ that, uh, you know, still exists and seems to be fairly um, substantial. Yeah, and again, as I, I've said on a number of occasions with any of these kinds of documents, the fact that we have any of these things at all is pretty remarkable. So, yeah, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. So let me ask everybody this. Of these three authors, of these three sources, do you feel like any one of them in particular would feel most at home in our congregation? I did, okay. I think. Say more. Well, based on um, when you were going through the chapters and things that he was, uh, that were listed in there, just seems like a lot of what we do. And even uh, the important contributions that you have listed on here seem pretty like what we're doing now. So kind of that contribution about this is how you conduct congregational life is important to the didache and we very much live as a congregation so yeah and the worship I, and I the structure that, and all that that'll, mm -hmm. that'll I, I would i would agree with kim and even take it a step further i think it might it it would probably be an interesting study to just look at that for a few weeks at some point if that would be possible yeah that's cool i will jot that my list of uh potential topics I like to have a deep bench of things we can 
study going forward. I also think a key feature is the fact that it determines who it, to, ways of determining who is genuine, who's not. Because the fear you have of the pro, other, other methods is that you get a bishop in place and you basically have driven in a headless nail. You're never going to get him out. And if he's bad, mm -hmm. if he's uh, not following God's way, you can't get rid of him. This one in, infers a way of either making testing them or putting them in for a term and removing them if they do not follow our cookbook. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, that idea of how do we set up a structure is, is important because it seems like maybe Clement and Ignatius maybe were a little more steeped in the Greek and Roman type of structures. They said, yep, we got to have that clear structure, whether it's a two-tiered structure, whether it's a three-tiered structure, whatever the case may be, we got to have these things fairly clearly outlined. The didache seems to have come from somewhere a little more Middle Eastern, somewhere in the greater Levant, I will say. And they seem to reflect a different structure. They're aware of bishops. They're aware of deacons because, yeah, they probably have some of the books in the New Testament as well. But they are operating on a model where leadership comes and goes from outside the community. So that, yeah, we're, we're looking at some very distinct structures here, even among these, these early sources. And just to let folks know, I mentioned jotting down ideas of, of future topics. Uh, the plan was to get into John's gospel at this time to be wrapping up John's gospel, but the, the study of Job was, was very far reaching. So we looked at the calendar and said with Lent coming up, we're gonna schedule John's gospel for later, possibly after Lent, possibly in the fall, it'll depend on how things shake out in the spring, but we, we will be getting to the fourth gospel. I can assure you of that. And maybe sometime in the future, we'll get to the Didache as well. Any final thoughts? Has everybody learned something tonight? I see some thumbs up. I see some nodding. Fantastic. Wonderful. Well, next week we will be back. Uh, we will still be immersed in the apostolic era. We're going to be looking at some of the debates uh, from people both inside and outside the church about what exactly do Christians believe. Uh, people outside the church saying, what do you crazy people actually believe? We're fascinated. We want to know. As well as people within the church saying, what do we believe? Do we believe this? No, of course we don't believe that. You're crazy. What do you mean I'm crazy? You're crazy. And so on and so on. So we'll be spending some time with that because the answers to those questions, the winners of those debates, have really deeply shaped the faith that we have today. So uh, let's go ahead and close our time together tonight praying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Blessings on your Wednesday evening, and uh, we'll see everybody soon. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Very well. Good night. Take care. Good night.